So um, today I'm here to talk about digital renaissance because we are in it. And I want to share with you how the digital natives are shaping the, the future life, your future society. And I know we are supposed to talk about rebellion and, and how we fight against authority. But let's face it, revolution is over. This is not happening anymore. We don't fight like this anymore. And French Revolution is probably one of the most iconic revolutions that you know. And the weird thing there is that French Revolution is somehow very close to us. It was based on throwing away monarchy and putting back uh, a republic instead. And there was a lot of issue in um, social and economic inequalities, environmental issues, uh, huge national debts, um, and, and a lot of problems with agriculture too. So it looks very familiar to what we know today. But the key difference is that today, the revolution movement is a bit different. You think WikiLeaks or Panama Papers, or the way you share your profile picture on Facebook to say, I want to support this country and I, and I feel um, connected to it. Uh, the Anonymous or Snowden, or even the Occupy Wall Street movement. And so we've moved from so to something more digital in the way we, we fight back uh, for IDs. In May 68, you would have gone through the street and through rocks to, to police to contest. Um, but today, it's a bit different. Today, you use your computer to interact with people. And so, I don't, I don't think we definitely change the way we want to interact with each other. So, we, we still fight for ideas. We want a better future. That's still something we love. And change is something very powerful in human beings. But we move from traditional activism to online clicktivism. So it's very a different way of interacting, which is digital. And so to truly understand the roots of this, this way to interact with each other, I will talk about digital natives. So back in the days, before 80s, the generation X, which is digital immigrants, they are new people, pioneers of the computers, the first computer were there. But they, are, they, they didn't know first-hand internet and so on. When we talk about digital natives, we are focusing on the people born after 80s and even after 95. These people always knew internet, they always knew uh, computers and digital life. They are fully connected, they have smartphones in their pockets, um, they have social media, they have the cloud, and so on. But that's, that's really something different. It's not only about technology, so you could say, yeah, there are just technology addicts or technoholics. But on the other hand, they have faced very tough challenges. You can think of terrorist attacks, financial crisis, or even global warming. And that's not an easy way uh, to start your life as a, as a newborn. And so the way I want to explore this with you is like digital natives are not that different from us. It's a, it's a um, generational change. But basically what, uh, what's changing is three key abilities the way we read, the way we write, and the way we connect to each other. So let's start with read. Actually, read started with the printing revolution and the Gutenberg machine. It was really the starting point of Renaissance and then the Enlightenment period and afterwards the scientific revolution. So printing press was something amazing. It allows you to share ideas on a mass scale. And we are living the exact same kind of revolution today with internet. Basically, you can learn anything you want. It's just a matter of you going to a website and choosing what you want to learn. And of course, you're using Wikipedia and, and YouTube on a daily basis. But I'm also talking about top universities that share free online courses, and there are thousands of them. So you can just learn whatever you want. On a more technical level, we have the same revolution. Information is everywhere. We have connected cars, we have IoT, Internet of Things, we have Internet, um, we have a lot of different things that help us to gain more insight and more information. And it's surrounding us everywhere, and it's about zettabytes, just at the hand, and, and you can access freely. But what comes with it is something very complex, like there is too much information. And even myself, I, I find sometimes like it's overwhelming. I don't know what to do with so much information. How can I deal with that? And humans are not that particularly well fit for huge data sets. It's, it's too much for us. So let's see how we can deal that with that in, in, the, in the next section. So writing. And writing is amazing. I mean, we are probably the only species on Earth that as the ability of transcoding emotion or ideas into abstract symbols. 
And it means that if I write something and I want to share this idea with you, I don't need to know you. You can just read the book afterwards. And this indirect link between humans is, is something very differentiating in, uh, in, the, in terms of PCs. But writing today, what is it in digital era? Well, it's pretty simple to me. It's code. Basically, code is the new ink, and you need to learn it today. And I know, you, you probably feel like coding is, yeah, it's too complicated. You need to be like Neo in the Matrix and have a plug in, in your head. But that's not true. And I, I want to show that to you is that coding is really damn easy. So we are going to, to learn how to code right now. And yeah, I have a couple minutes left, so it's OK. Um, the first thing I want to share with you is the hello world. Every programmer starts with this kind of line of code. Is it complicated? Seriously? What you see is a couple of words, and it's an instruction. And what does it do? It displays hello to the on a screen. It's amazing. And OK, I cheated a bit. That's the end of the course. But the key point there is a programming language is not that difficult. It's only 50 keywords, basically English. And when you learn French, you need to learn like 30,000 of words. We have things called variables when we can store value in it. And that's nice, but that's not different from a post-it on your fridge. And same thing, we have operators and functions and things that we can call. In real life, you have mathematics. Do you feel comfortable with mathematics too? And last but not least, we have, of course, logic and, and way to build uh, algorithms. But this is very simple. We have binary. It's one is a yes, zero is a no. When you talk to a human, then <laughs> you basically end up with interpretation and did he say yes, or is it a maybe, or a no? We don't, we don't know each other, really. And the last point is that there is no excuse. There are so many free courses. And I really encourage you to go to code.org and start learning today. I do that with my children. So they are, So the, the, the last one is only six months old, so I, I need to wait a bit. But um, <laughs> the, the, the older one are five years old and three years old. And they like it. It's a game. It's basically you have a maze. You have an angry bird that you need to escape from this maze. And that's very simple. They learn basically how to transpose this puzzle into instruction. And later on, there are more complex courses, but it's, it's a game for them. And they like it, and they ask for it. So I'm not even pushing them. So the real thing is that you don't have a choice about learning co how to code. Why? Well, because we rely on computers, and we rely on artificial intelligence. And there is no way back. We, we have too much at stake. And so if we don't understand properly what code is and how to, how to read it, basically, then we are kind of losing against the machine. And I want to talk about singularity. So technological singularity is basically when artificial intelligence gets smarter than us. It's kind of frightening, but it's something that's happening already. So one month ago, um, Google AlphaGo defeated the Go champion. And Go is a very simple game. It's only about territory, uh, a white and, and black pill, and, and then you try to win against. And it, has, it was considered to be a very a, a tough challenge for artificial intelligence because there are so many um, possibilities when you explore that game. But now, computers are better than us at that. And it's not only that, so we have also the connected cars and then the self-driving cars. And when you think about self-driving cars, like take the Google cars. Let's say there will be an accident because you know it, and you have the choice between hitting a pedestrian or crashing into the wall. What should you do? And who is going to write this code? So there is a lot involved in this singularity aspect, and artificial intelligence is there. There is, there is no doubt about it. But we better understand what's at stake to be sure that the next step that we take is not killing ourselves. And again, it's not about only robots and artificial intelligence. So this is a study from Oxford University. So basically, they took a look at the US labor market. And they said, OK, we have different type of jobs. Let's look on which one we can computerize or replace by robots. And that's what you see on the, on the far right. So it's jobs like transportation, construction, production line. It's something that we can easily replace, and, and we are already replacing them with machines. And so the conclusion is, is frightening, because basically 47% of the jobs in the US can easily be replaced by computers. And that's happening. And so if you think about it, I say, let's go for it. 
yeah, let's reach this 47% of unemployment. That's nice, actually. And why? Let, let's say because I think humans are better than just filling box. Humans are about creativity. And so it's really something that we need to understand that machines are good at doing some stuff, and we are better at doing other stuff. But there is no goal in just filling box, uh, doing the same, exam, the same exact uh, repetitive task every single day. So, when you think about it, it's, it's, a, it's a choice, but it's also an opportunity for humans to focus on what they make them happy. The last point I want to talk after reading and writing skills is the way we connect today. And the interaction is, is very fundamental to the human behavior. Why? Yeah, of course, we need to reproduce, and, and for the survival of species, it, it doesn't work otherwise. But still, um, Connection is something very strong, and we really thrive when we connect with each other, when we exchange ideas. And this is a representation of 62, so it's very old, actually. And the idea was, how can we make networks more resilient? And, and, and the, first, the first graph is representing a centralized network. And you say, okay, what does it have to do with me? Actually, it has everything to do with the way we organize our society. The centralized network was nothing else than a monarchy or feudalism or, or despotism. That was the way we organized the, the society back then. And then we moved to democracy and indirect democracy, something like a decentralized network. And then now we are starting slowly to understand what a fully connected network is with social, uh, sharing economy. And sharing economy, you, you know it already. It's Uber, it's Airbnb. Uh, but the thing that we don't know yet is how it's impacting our day life. And we are still arguing, uh, is it right or not to do this? But it's happening, and people are connecting it with each other in a very more closer way than before. What's also happening is this revolution of the way we organize network is attacking other, um, other systems, like the banking system. So banking were there like, for two main reasons, trust and liquidity. And to be honest, in, with financial crisis, I cannot say this does this work very well. And we have new means. We have Bitcoin. I don't want to get into technical of, of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is a digital money, so it's not very different from the way you send money through your online banking. But what's behind Bitcoin is something more relevant. It's the blockchain. Blockchain is the idea that the transaction system and the way we trust each other is coded in the network. So today, I wire you some money, the bank say, OK, I take out this money of the US account and I give it to you. And we trust the bank to be uh, accurate about this. With the Bitcoin and the blockchain, we can do the same because everyone has a copy of this transaction. So there's no way to falsify it. And the next frontier for this new system and, and, and using the blockchain is probably democracy and the way we organize political uh, organization. So far, what we did is indirect democracy. But I, I must say, I'm a bit nostalgic of the direct democracy ID. And it's feasible today. We it's often say, OK, it's too complicated to have direct democracy with a mass society. It's not true anymore. We have the blockchain, and we could use it to have this, this scheme. Basically, what we can do is say, OK, I want to vote for this topic because I feel concerned, or I trust someone else that I know to vote for me. And on a very question-by-question question level, so more granularity. And it's, it can be also done for the budget. But liquid democracy is this idea that everyone is involved and very closer. So we, we bring back the people closer to the decision. So it increases granularity, but also increases transparency. And, and we feel more responsible about it. And so that's about it. Digital Renaissance is something that's close to a generation. So there is no way back. The generation are moving forward. But there is a key difference between Renaissance and digital Renaissance. At Renaissance, we were thinking like, yeah, we need to put human at the center of the universe. And it's not the case anymore. We need to understand that truly that human is only a part of this ecosystem. It's, it must be highly connected and interact with it, but it has to be active. And so to embrace this, this digital Renaissance, you basically need to develop these three skills. You need to start reading, choose your learning platform, whatever it is, and learn something. Second, start to code. You need to understand what code is, and there, there is no way around it. And it, it's easy, it's free. Uh, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't do that. And the last and, and important point is 
the way networks are organizing themselves, it's not about Facebook and, and LinkedIn and, and the way we are connected. It's the way that we uh, interact with each other, like these transactions in the sharing economy are profoundly affecting the way we live together. And that's it. I just want you to act on these three points and entering this digital renaissance for the better world. Thank you. <laughs>